This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. What is it? What use is it? How do economists do it? What's the connection between economics, morals, and politics? How does it fit in to the general scheme of understanding human behavior in society? The idea of doing this course of lectures came to me after the crash of 2008. It seemed to me that very few economists predicted it. And after the crash happened, there was a big division among economists on what to do about it. The rescue operation was really done by politicians with very little economic input. And so economists seemed to be fiddling while Rome was burning. And a student said to me, well, what's the point of doing economics if it can't explain what's going on in the world, suggest policies to prevent catastrophes like this from happening? What I came to realize and what I eventually told them was the, the flaws come out of the method of doing economics, about out of the way economics was actually done in the way the models were set up and conclusions drawn from them. For example, if you believe that financial markets are perfectly efficient, as most economists before the slump would have said, then you're very unlikely to devise policies for greater regulation. You're more likely to say, well, let the financial markets do their best. They'll accurately calculate risks and very little can go wrong. And that tended to be the attitude uh, before, before the crash. Economists have usually poured scorn on methodology. Paul Samuelson, a Nobel laureate, famously wrote, those who can do science, those who can't prattle on about methodology. And you get the same thought from Frank Hahn, an eminent British economist. I would advise the young to avoid spending too much time or thought on methodology. As for them learning philosophy, what next? So two eminent economists didn't see the need for students of economics to think about what they were doing. Learn your lessons and apply them, was their message, as you'd tell a robot. By and large, economics courses seem designed for human robots. Now, if economics were really a science, we might agree with Samuelson that questions about methodology, how you do it, to what purpose, are a waste of time. The natural sciences have evolved as search engines for the discovery of truth. Unless big doubts develop as to their capacity to progress towards truth, as does happen from time to time in natural sciences, or quasi-natural sciences like medicine, no one questions their methodology. Economics is obviously not a search engine for truth. Insofar as economists have a purpose at all, it's to improve material welfare. We have ample cause to question the fitness of the discipline for that, both in terms of the intellectual instruments they develop and in terms of the purpose itself. And so the aim of these 12 conversations is to get students to think about what they're doing, to question the claims of the subject. Because as I hope I'll show, economics is far from being the science that Paul Samuelson cracked it up to be. Now, in thinking about the subject. Philosophy is an essential part of any such thinking. As one philosopher put it, if we didn't study philosophy, the academic bandwagon would rush by without being stopped to ask, where the hell is it going? And why does it want to get there? So philosophic reflection is crucial in this area. History is an essential part of doing the philosophy of economics. For what it shows is that much of contemporary economics, what you get in textbooks, has always been very fiercely contested, argued about, even by some of the greatest names in the history of the discipline. 
if you study economics in the light of history, you enter into conversation with some of the greatest minds of economics who are otherwise not there. They've been, you know, obliterated from a standard course, but here they are. The economics we know is mainly the construction of British and American economists, with a few notable outliers, mainly from earlier in the history of the subject. I mean, they used to be different schools, and these were re very recognizable, and in, in the history of economic thought, one used to have these taught. But now that the history of economic thought has itself been abandoned virtually, um, but in, in most departments, we only know um, tech, the textbook versions. Now, one of the most remarkable things, if you read, if you, if you look at the modern textbooks, is the persistence of the methodology, and thus of most of the conclusions derived from it, over time, in face of many disconfirming attacks. And most of the, criti the critiques of the, um, of the methodology have, have really been like water off a duck's back, glancing blows at most, the reasons for such methodological, or in Thomas Kuhn's words, paradigm persistence in face of these attacks from people who said, well, look, the models don't tell you anything about the real world, or they're biased in this way or that way. Nevertheless, they've gone on. The models have persisted because economics um, has felt that it is a hard science and has got a method of arriving at the truth which is so good that it can resist all attacks against it. True enough, the neoclassical economics that you learn today in the textbook isn't exactly the same as the economics of the 1980s. There are changes that are going on, very, very small changes. There have been, for example, behavioral economics. But macroeconomics has been la largely unaffected since the 1980s, and it hasn't really changed since the crisis of 2008, 2009. We'll find, I think, that the persistence, a certain way of thinking in economics, has two reasons behind it. One, internal resistances to change. Those have been analyzed by philosophers of science like Thomas Kuhn and Lakatos, both the difficulty of affecting a paradigm shift within a discipline. But there's a very important external reason for the persistence, and that is the power structure in a society. There's quite a lot of consistency between the way economics is done and the way people in power would like it to be done. And that point, of course, was made most strongly in the history of the discipline by Karl Marx, who wrote, the ruling ideas are always and everywhere the ideas of the ruling class. And so one aspect of the study of the history of economics and the philosophy of economics is to understand its place in the power structure of Western societies, just as um, it's the outbreaks of discontent um, with the way our rulers are managing economies today, which have propelled um, the attempts to reconstruct the discipline. Two main divisions in economics, or definitions, I should say. First is that it's the study of the causes of economic growth. That is the title of Adam Smith's famous 18th century book, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. That sets economics its agenda. Why um, are some countries growing rich while others are staying poor? But in the late 19th century, that description of the subject was superseded by a second neoclassical definition, famously given by Lionel Robbins in 1932. Economics is the science which studies behavior as a relationship between unlimited wants and limited resources which have alternative uses. This is the definition you'll find in most textbooks today. The core of neoclassical eco economics is how a given quantity of wealth can be most efficiently allocated to satisfy human wants. That's the core. Efficiency 
in allocation is really the core of microeconomics, and microeconomics is the core of economics. In fact, if one delves more deeply into it, the two aims, growth and efficient allocation, are not inconsistent with each other. At the same time as um, aiming to grow the economy, we should be concerned with allocation because the more efficient the allocation, the faster, presumably, the growth. That, that's the argument at any rate. Both classical and neoclassical economics believe in the superiority of the market as a mechanism for achieving both growth and allocation. Why hit on the market as, as, the, as the efficient coordinator? Because the alternatives were dire. I mean, at that time, no one, of course, um, was interested uh, or heard of the idea of central planning in the 18th century. Um, and, 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 and maybe they would have uh, tried to escape from it as, 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 as radically as we have once, it, once that system collapsed. But no one had heard of it. So what was the alternative was the king and a lot of restrictions on economic activity, a huge amount of corruption, lots of wars for the sake of seizing wealth, going on the whole time. So, of course, economists thinking about a better way find it in a market system self-regulating and aloof or isolated, removed from the interferences of corrupt rulers, um, people with vested interests, um, military uh, um, projects, and all that kind of thing. So they find this in the market. And, of course, um, that's, that's huge. The birth of scientific economics in the 18th century coincided with the most rapid economic growth um, in human history. Sustained economic growth really started in the 18th century, just about the time that Adam Smith was telling people how to do it. That is really the coincidence, if you like, um, that gave economics its enormous prestige. There's an interesting question. Would we have had any less economic growth had no one ever invented economics? I'm not convinced that economics added a crucial element of value to the economy. Perhaps I am wrong. I think it probably did add something of value. Quite difficult to know what it is. So let's go back. The two definitions, an inquiry into the causes of the growth of wealth and an inquiry into how given resources are allocated most efficiently. They're not inconsistent, but the focus shifted from the growth to the allocation in the following ways. One, it shifted from insufficiency of supply to insatiability of demand. Unlimited wants facing limited resources. Well, people had always sort of understood that the resources were limited. But what about this thing of insatiability of wants? Suddenly, you've shifted the economic problem quite dramatically. It's almost insoluble um, if, you, if you do it that way, unless there's a vast increase in efficiency, vast increase in economizing on your inputs. Um, in order to get a required output. So I think that's the shift um, which, 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 which comes about with the, with the uh, uh, kind of redefinitions of the subject in the 19th century. Second, a shift from institutions to individuals. Wants are things that individuals want. You, you know, the, the, the church or the government, we might say it wants something, but we're really, that's a figure of speech. It's individuals. Now, needs is a broader category, but it's certainly individuals uh, uh, there. But um, anyway, once you start um, talking about wants, you are into the field of individual psychology. You have shifted your, your perspectives on growth from the behavior of institutions to the imagination of individuals. And the third shift that uh, seems to be important is you shift from narrative to mathematics. 
much of the course um, will be about trying to explain why this shift took place. And its main conclusion, I say it in advance, is that what economics gained in sharpness, uh, it lost in breadth of understanding. The discipline became much sharper, much tighter, uh, but it lost a lot of understanding. In, in fact, you can paradoxically say that contemporary generation of economists are not as good economists as they were uh, 100 years ago. Um, although they're technically better, they understand less 